Good morning and welcome. Good morning, welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. This morning, CPSC staff will be briefing the commission on draft notice of proposed rulemaking for magnets. Um, uh, draft notice of rulemaking to establish a consumer product safety standard for magnets. But before we start the briefing, I wanted to note that last night the Senate confirmed uh, Rich Trumka Jr. to serve as commissioner. I look forward to working with him, but honestly, it's bittersweet, uh, as it means that Commissioner Adler's impressive 12 years as both commissioner and acting chair is coming to a close. Bob, you've always um, been a, a non-relenting, shown an unrelenting commitment to consumer protection and to the staff of the CPSC. I've greatly enjoyed my time as your colleague. And um, of course, until Rich is sworn in, you'll still be here. I look forward to your active participation in today's briefing and briefings coming up or other decisions that the commission is going to make uh, while you remain a member of the commission. So thank you. And with that, I'll turn to Dave. Yeah, Please thanks bye. so much, Alex. I, no, I appreciate it. And I just want to say, and I'll probably say it again, it's great to have you on board. I think Rich will be a superb uh, commissioner. Uh, and uh, I can't thank CPSC's wonderful staff enough. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bob. Turning to today's business, this is the first of four briefings on important rulemaking packages in the coming weeks. Uh, the draft rule on magnets was developed after years of work at the commission focused on preventing the devastating harm primarily to children and teens resulting from the ingestion of small powerful magnets As too many parents have learned these magnets can attach to one another or metals through connective uh, tissue walls ripping through internal organs or blocking digestive systems such events can cause long-term damage or even death this Draft rule brings together years of research and incident reports and an understanding of the market. The proposed performance requirements for certain magnet products under Section 7 and 9 of the Consumer Product Safety Act. If adopted, the public will have an opportunity to comment on the proposal. I know that we all have a lot of questions for staff, so we'll turn this over to them to brief us. Once we've completed, they've completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions of the staff with multiple rounds. Uh, following staff net members will brief the commission. Um, Stephen Hershani, engineering psychologist with the Division of Human Factors, directed for en Directorate for Engineering Sciences and Project Man Manager for Magnets. Meredith Kelsch, uh, attorney in the Regulatory Affairs Division. Also in attendance are Mary Boyle, CPSC Executive Director, Pamela Stone, Acting General Counsel, and Abi uh, Moshim, who is acting for Alberta Mills, our uh, CPSC secretary. Uh, one final point before I turn this meeting over to staff. Any questions to staff that address the agency's legal authority should be withheld until closed executive session, which the commission will hold directly after this public briefing. Thanks to all, and I turn the gavel over to Mr. Harshani and Ms. Kelsch. Welcome. Thank you. Um, as our chair mentioned, I am Stephen Arshani, and I am presenting today with Meredith Kelsch. We are honored to be here with you today. As stated, we are here to brief the commission on the draft notice of proposed rulemaking for hazardous magnet products. <clears throat> Just checking, you can hear me clearly, right? Great. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> the draft proposed rule seeks to address effectively the internal interaction hazard associated with the ingestion of hazardous magnets. The presentation will begin with opening statements on the rulemaking process, after which we will present explanations of the following. The hazard and involved products, existing standards and prohibitions, staff's proposed rule for addressing the hazard, and staff's economic analysis of the hazard and the proposed rule. Next slide, please. Now I'll, I'll hand it over to Meredith. Good morning. As the chairman mentioned, I am Meredith Kelsch. I am an attorney with the Office of the General Counsel in the Regulatory Affairs Division. 
So I will be giving a brief overview of the statutory framework for issuing a standard under the Consumer Product Safety Act. This rulemaking falls under Section 7 and 9 of the CPSA. Section 7 of the CPSA authorizes the Commission to issue consumer product safety standards that consist of performance requirements or requirements regarding warnings or instructions. Any requirements must be reasonably necessary to prevent or reduce an unreasonable risk of injury associated with the product. Section 7 of the CPSA also specifies that consumer product safety standards must be issued in accordance with the requirements in Section 9 of the statute. Slide 4, please. Section 9 of the CPSA provides procedural and substantive requirements for issuing a consumer product safety standard. It specifies that a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or NPR, must include the text of the proposed rule, alternatives to the proposed rule, and a preliminary regulatory analysis. It also requires that the Commission make certain findings before issuing the final rule. In addition, the Commission must provide two opportunities for comment. First, Section 9 requires that rulemaking be in accordance with Section 553 of the Administrative Procedure Act, which requires agencies to give notice of a proposed rule and the opportunity to submit written comments on it. Second, Section 9 requires the Commission to provide an opportunity for interested parties to make oral presentations of data, views, and arguments. Slide 5, please. As I mentioned, one required component of an NPR is a preliminary regulatory analysis. Section 9 of the CPSA provides specific elements that must be included in the preliminary regulatory analysis. It must discuss potential benefits and costs of the rule and who is likely to receive and bear them, reasons the standard submitted to the Commission was not published as part of the proposed rule, and alternatives to the proposed rule, their potential costs and benefits, and reasons they were not chosen. In addition to supporting the preliminary regulatory analysis, information about costs and benefits associated with the rule also helps form the basis for several of the required findings for a final rule. Slide six, please. As I mentioned, to issue a final rule, the Commission must consider and make specific findings, and those findings must be included in the rule. Although the Commission does not have to make these findings at the NPR stage, preliminary findings are included in an NPR because Section 9 requires that the findings be included in the regulatory text, which must be provided in an NPR, and because this provides an opportunity for interested parties to comment on the findings. This slide shows eight of the nine required findings. Slide seven, please. The final finding deals with voluntary standards. If a voluntary standard that addresses the risk of injury at issue has been adopted and implemented, the Commission must find that either compliance with the voluntary standard is not likely to adequately reduce the risk of injury, or that there is not likely to be substantial compliance with it. I will now turn it over to Stephen, who will provide further information about the briefing package and draft proposed rule. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, next slide, please. Under the draft proposed rule, all loose or separable magnets in certain amusement and jewelry products must either be too large to fit entirely within CPSC's small part cylinder, or each magnet must have a magnetic flux index less than 50, as measured by the procedures described in the ASTM F963 toy standard. In the following slides, I will discuss the product scope, hazard, data, and specifics of the draft proposed rule, including staff's cost-benefit analysis. Staff is concerned in particular about certain magnet products intended for amusement and or jewelry, which are not already subject to the magnet strength and size requirements in the toy standard. Most notably, this group of INSCO products includes magnet sets, which staff generally considers to be aggregations of separable magnetic objects that are marketed or commonly used as manipulative or construction items for entertainment, such as puzzle working, sculpture building, mental stimulation, or stress relief. These products often, can, often include hundreds to thousands of loose hazardous magnets. The scope includes other magnet products intended for amusement, such as those marketed as adult or executive desk toys, as well as child and adult jewelry with separable magnets. Next slide, please. 
Regarding out-of-scope products, in addition to children's toys subject to the toy standard, other products considered out-of-scope include home and kitchen products, such as shower curtains and hardware, education and research products, such as science kits for schools and universities, provided that they are not also intended for amusement or jewelry. Our primary hazard of concern is the internal interaction hazard posed by magnets small enough to be swallowed and strong enough to interact internally through body tissue, such as the intestinal walls, and resist natural bodily forces to separate. Internal interaction of these hazardous magnets has led to intestinal twisting, perforations, and other injuries with corresponding acute and long-term adverse health consequences, including deaths. The internal interaction hazard posed by hazardous magnets has been well documented for more than a decade by CPSC, foreign regulators, medical associations, and consumer advocacy groups. Um, can you go back one slide? Thank you. Hazardous magnets involved in ingestion incidents had various compositions, shapes, and strengths. Through testing, staff found that ferrite rock-shaped magnets typically have a magnetic flux index upwards of 700. NIB 5 millimeter diameter magnets, such as included in most magnet sets, typically measure 300 to 400. Staff is continuing to investigate smaller diameter NIB magnets, such as 2.5 millimeter spherical magnets found in some magnet sets. We found that 2.5 millimeter spherical magnets typically measured between about 27 and 74. Staff has reviewed reports for five deaths in the U.S. involving the ingestion of hazardous magnets, which occurred between November 2005 and January 2021. Staff also reviewed reports of two deaths abroad within this time frame. Of the seven reported deaths, the most recent death specified a magnet set was involved, and four of the prior deaths involved uncertain products described consistent with magnet sets, such as a fidget toy building set with spherical magnets estimated to be three to five millimeters in diameter. Considering the CPSRMS data, which includes anecdotal reports of incidents CPSC receives, there were 284 CPSRMS reported magnet ingestion incidents from January 2010 through December 2020. Excluding incidents involving products identified by staff as subject to the toy standard and products not intended for amusement or jewelry, there were 257 incidents considered in scope. At least 124 incidents resulted in surgery, such as bowel resection, and at least 108 incidents involved internal interaction through body tissue. Based on the NICE reported data, which include generalizable reports of injuries treated in U.S. emergency departments, staff estimates 23,700 emergency department treated magnet ingestion cases from January 2010 through December 2020. Excluding known out of scope products, staff estimates 22,500 cases in scope within this period. Staff estimates 18,000 victims were treated and at least initially released, and 4,200 victims were hospitalized or transferred upon emergency department visit. It is important to consider that NICE data typically include only brief emergency department intake reports. Victims presenting with magnet ingestion may initially be sent home to monitor for natural passage, so these injury estimates likely understate the number of severe cases. Furthermore, we excluded from the analysis cases that reported uncertain ingestion of magnets during the emergency department intake, and some portion of these cases may have been in scope. Considering also the CPSRMS reported data, which typically include more information about the product and incident, victims ranged from six months to 54 years of age. The majority of the victims were between five years and 16 years old, meaning ages above those intended to be protected by child-resistant packaging and above the ages typically associated with ingesting inedible objects. Almost half of the victims were eight years or older, meaning ages that caregivers would expect to understand warnings and not expect to consume magnets. <clears throat> the majority of the CPS RMS reported incidents involved magnet sets and products identified or described as magnet toys or jewelry. 
For nice cases where a product type was identified or described, similarly, magnet sets, magnet toys, and jewelry were the most common. However, the majority of the nice cases involved magnets from unidentified products. Based on numerous factors discussed hereafter, staff concludes it is likely that a substantial proportion of the magnet ingestion incidents for which product identification lacks certainty involved amusement and jewelry products not subject to the toy standard. Where use of the magnets at the time of ingestion was reported, the majority of the victims were playing with the magnets or using them as jewelry. Use as jewelry was especially prevalent among older children and teens. Where specified, the majority of the reports indicated the magnets were ingested accidentally. Accidental ingestion is very concerning because caregivers, children, and teens are likely to find it difficult to anticipate and appreciate the likelihood of older children and teens accidentally ingesting multiple magnets or magnets and ferromagnetic objects. They may also misunderstand the severity of the hazard and progression of symptoms, as magnet ingestion symptomatology is often delayed and misdiagnosed as unrelated illnesses. Victims typically found magnets loose in their environments or received magnets loose from relatives and friends. For example, reports commonly describe students bringing sets of magnets to school and distributing the magnets among their peers. The since vacated 2014 rule on magnet sets extended to magnet sets the ASTM F963 magnet strength and size requirements. The NICE CPS RMS and also poison control center data demonstrate that magnet ingestions drop significantly and substantially in the period that the rule was announced and in place and rose significantly and substantially in the years after the year it was vacated. As detailed in staff's NPR package, multiple studies have corroborated this analysis. Staff concludes that these trends likely demonstrate that the 2014 rule was effective that ingestion cases rose significantly in recent years because the rule is no longer in effect, and that the majority of, of the magnet ingestions involved magnet sets. In the years 2006 through 2009, coinciding with the toy standards prohibition of hazardous magnets and magnetic components in children's toys, CPSC announced more than a dozen recalls of children's toys due to this hazard. Since 2010, that is the past 11 and a half years, there have been only two recalls of children's toys with magnets for violations of the magnet requirements in the toy standard. The substantial decline in recalls of children's toys suggests that children's toys now largely comply with the toy standard and rarely are involved in internal interaction incidents. It adds support for the identification and prohibition of hazardous magnets specified in the toy standard. It also adds support for staff's conclusion that the majority of magnet ingestion incidents since 2010 did not involve children's toys subject to the toy standard. There are four domestic standards pertaining to hazardous magnets and consumer products. One is the children's toy standard, ASTM F963, which has been incorporated by reference into a mandatory standard. The remaining three are voluntary standards that reference F963. F963 prohibits loose or separable hazardous magnets and magnetic components to be used in toys intended for children under 14 years of age. An exemption is included for magnetic electrical experimental sets for children ages eight years of age and over. For F963, a hazardous magnet or magnetic component is one that both fits entirely within the small part cylinder and also has a magnetic flux index of 50 or greater. Two international standards, EN71-1 and ISO 8124-1 are very similar to F963, including in the prohibition of hazardous magnets. The remaining three domestic standards are relevant to some of the subject products, including children's jewelry, adult jewelry, and magnet sets not covered by the toy standard. However, these standards are too limited in product scope and rely too heavily on safety information. As staff has detailed in numerous briefing packages and other public forums, warnings and other methods of persuading consumers to avoid the hazard are inadequate measures for addressing this life-threatening hidden hazard. Staff is aware of dozens of incidents of magnet ingestion, which involves products with clear warnings about the hazard and against use by children. For example, the briefing package identifies in particular 17 recent incidents from 2018 to mid-2021 which demonstrated the failure of clear and repeated warnings about the hazard and use by children 
and which had marketing only to adults. Similarly, staff had examined websites for numerous magnet products marketed only to adults, which had many reviews indicating use by young children. Furthermore, magnet ingestions have continued an upward trend over the past years, despite over a decade of CPSC informational campaigns and recalls, and consumer awareness raising activities from numerous medical associations and consumer advocacy groups. Regulators in other countries, including Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, have prohibitions for magnets and children's toys, similar to ASTM F 963, as well as general prohibitions for certain magnet products intended for amusement, including magnet sets. Australia and New Zealand also include general prohibitions for certain magnetic jewelry products. I was informed by Health Canada staff that they would consider magnetic jewelry as well on a case-by-case -case basis. The European Commission also has prohibitions for magnets and children's toys similar to ASTM F963. Member states generally apply the children's toy requirements to other magnet products that are likely to be used by children, including magnet sets marketed for adult use. Staff recommends addressing this hazard through performance requirements for products with one or more magnets, which are loose or separable, and designed, marketed, or intended to be used by consumers for entertainment, jewelry, including children's jewelry, mental stimulation, stress relief, or a combination of these amusement and jewelry purposes. The scope excludes children's toys, which are already subject to the magnet requirements in F963. Based on this definition, products intended only for education, research, home, or kitchen uses would also fall outside the scope of the rule, as long as they do not otherwise meet the criteria in the definition. Staff recommends that loose or separable magnets in these amusement and jewelry products comply with the magnet size and strength requirements established by ASTM F963. Setting the limit to less than 50 will address the known hazardous magnet products on the market, which typically are over 300. Furthermore, to comply with this rule, manufacturers are likely to create magnets below this limit in order to account for manufacturing variants. In testing magnet sets, staff has found magnets that measured within the acceptable range. As discussed in the draft NPR package, staff recommends listening comments from the public, such as whether safety information and packaging requirements are necessary for magnets with a magnetic flux index under 50. Unit sales of the subject products are unknown, but could range from about 250,000 to 1 million per year. Retail prices vary by type of product and number and size of magnets. Magnet sets commonly average about $20 per unit. Nearly all of the magnets sub sorry, nearly, nearly all of the magnets subject to the proposed rule are imported from Chinese manufacturers. Most current manufacturers and importers sell through internet sites. Most are on large internet retailing platforms, but a few sell on their own sites. U.S. consumers can also order magnet products directly from sellers based in China. Based on CPSC's Injury Cost Model Estimates, or ICM, the total aggregate annual benefits of the draft proposed rule in terms of the reduced societal costs of ingestion injuries to children could be about $80 million to $95 million annually, assuming 500,000 units. The cost of the rule would predominantly consist of the following lost consumer surplus, lost producer surplus, certification costs, potentially ranging from 10 million to 17 and a half million annually. Thus, although both the benefits and costs of the draft proposed rule are uncertain, staff est staff's estimates suggest that the benefits of the draft proposed rule may exceed the costs. These estimates exclude the magnet ingestion cases with unidentified products. To the extent that the unidentified products were subject to the draft proposed rule, which staff assesses is likely, these estimates could understate substantially the potential benefits of the rule. Based on ICM estimates for unidentified magnet products involved in ingestion injuries, average annual societal cost of ingestion injuries totaled 151.8 million. The cost of a rule could be offset to some extent by manufacturers and importers switching to products that comply with the rule and fulfill the same or similar purposes, or otherwise repurposing their facilities. However, staff is unable to quantify the magnitude of these potential offsets.
As detailed in the draft NPR package, staff considered alternatives to the draft proposed rule, including alternative performance requirements, requirements for packaging, warnings, and aversive agents, a longer effective date, and relying on ASTM activities. Staff does not recommend these alternatives because staff does not consider them adequate measures by which to address this serious and often misunderstood hazard. ASTM F3458, which is focused on non-children's toy magnet sets, does not currently include performance requirements limiting the capability of magnets to be swallowed and present the hazard. The ASTM subcommittee for the standard, F1577, is planning to ballot magnet strength and size requirements consistent with F963. However, it is uncertain if and when this will succeed and to what extent the scope will be limited. All of the importers of magnet sets are small businesses, and this is also likely true for manufacturers and importers of other subject magnet products, such as jewelry with loose or separable magnets. The main impact on small businesses of the draft proposed rule would be the lost income and profits to firms that could not produce, import, and sell non-compliant products in the future. The draft proposed rule could have a significant adverse impact on a few small importers which are believed to receive nearly all of their revenues from sales of the subject magnet products. The draft proposed rule extends to certain amusement and jewelry products, such as magnet sets, the magnet size, and strength requirements established by ASTM F963. Under the draft proposed rule, loose or separable magnets in these products must either be too large to be swallowed or weak enough that they are unlikely to pose risks of internal interaction injuries. The draft proposed rule is supported by the following factors, among others. Magnet ingestion incident trends, known products involved in incidents, hazardous use patterns, CPSC recall activity, domestic and international standards and prohibitions, ASTM magnet subcommittee activity, human factors and medical literature, and input from medical associations and consumer advocacy groups. Through testing, staff found there are magnets that already comply with the draft proposed rule, which are marketed for the same purposes. So we know that it is feasible to manufacture compliant magnets. And now we're going to present a video of one way to test the magnetic flux index of a spherical magnet consistent with ASTM F963. This demonstration shows one method to calculate the magnet flux index consistent with ASTM F963. Cross-sectional area. To measure the cross-sectional area of the pole, calipers are used. The magnet is placed in between the jaws of the calipers, and the calipers are closed onto the magnet, revealing the diameter. The cross-sectional area of a spherical magnet where the pole exists is a circle calculated by pi times the diameter squared divided by 4. Pole location. To locate the poles, a film can be used. Encased in this green film are millions of magnetic particles suspended in oil. The magnet attracts these tiny particles to the areas where the magnet is the strongest at its poles. The image created is identical to the magnetic field of the magnet. Flux density. Magnets contain two poles, a north pole and a south pole. The strength of the magnets are highest at these poles. The flux index is a rhetorical number that can represent the strength of the magnets. This number is dependent on the size and flux density of the magnets. The flux density is a value of the strength of the magnetic field. Visually, the more wavy the lines in the magnetic field, as shown, the higher the strength. A Gauss meter is an instrument that measures the strength of the magnetic field or flux density. For any test equipment, they first must be zeroed. The probe is placed in a zeroing chamber and the instrumentation is then zeroed. The magnet is placed in putty to keep attention on the pole as shown. The probe is then placed on the pole surface. Since the pole surface is small, the probe is moved along to make sure the peak or the highest value is captured. To calculate the flux index of the magnet, it's the square of the flux reading times the cross-sectional area of the pole. In this case, the flux density comes out to the reading as shown. For the magnet in this demonstration, the magnetic flux index is calculated as shown.
Thank you for listening to the presentation. I'm going to leave now. Just kidding. <laughs> Thank you very much to both of you for uh, the excellent presentation. I appreciate it. At this point in time, uh, we'll be turning to questions. I'll start and then we'll go in order of seniority of the commissioners. Um, again, thanks to both of you for, for uh, going through that detailed presentation. Um, the proposed rule uh, covers magnet sets and jewelry, but doesn't cover kitchen household magnets. I was wondering what the thinking was in, along those lines, given that some of those magnets can be small as well and potentially open to ingestion. I guess maybe I'll, uh, Mr. Harshani, maybe I'll turn to you for that. Unless Ms. Kelsch is better to answer that. I mean, she's welcome to if she wants, but <laughs> uh, you're asking why would we exclude potentially identical products um, intended for out-of-scope purposes, correct? Yes. Based on the current data, staff concludes that the hazard is less likely to occur with these products, which have functional utility different from amusement and jewelry, and which are therefore less likely to be acquired and used by children and teens for playing and jewelry. Um, we include a detailed explanation in the draft NPR package and also recommend soliciting public comments on these exclusions. Thank you. Um, staff also cites uh, data showing statistically significant decreases in harmful magnet ingestions during the period of the original magnet rule that was in effect and increases once it was overturned. Uh, can you describe how the marketplace has changed in the years since the original rule was overturned? And who's selling these, market, uh, these magnets now and, and how is the marketplace operating? Yeah, I, I can't get into too much detail at the moment. I'd, I'd prefer to get back to you on that from my econ staff. However, um, yes, we, we, we observed a noticeable reduction in injuries during the vacated rule on magnet sets. And after it, we noticed a, a massive surge in them, um, particularly um, sales online from Chinese manufacturers and importers. And it's we're noticing it's a lot more prevalent to have small, powerful magnets in consumer products intended for entertainment and jewelry. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to get to my, my uh, fellow commissioners now, so I'm going to hold any other additional questions. I'm going to turn to uh, Commissioner Adler. You are muted, Commissioner. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, you can hear me? Oh, okay, wonderful. Uh, first of all, Stephen and Meredith, thank you for a superb presentation. It's incredibly comprehensive. Um, and uh, I love the video <laughs> and it reminded me I'm not an engineer. So it's, it's good to know that there are folks who have that kind of technical skill. Uh, I, I did want to start with a comment, not so much with a question. And my comment goes to your slide 16. And also uh, I looked at table four on page 25. And to me, it says there, it carries a couple of important messages. Message number one, Safety standards really work. When we had the safety standard in effect, uh, injuries fell by a dramatic amount. And uh, conclusion number two, uh, decisions like the Tenth Circuit have real life consequences. I, I'm quite certain that the judges on the Tenth Circuit uh, were sincere and thoughtful in handing down their decision. I strongly disagree with it still. But this shows a really tragic picture of what happened when the standard was invalidated. Uh, by the most cautious estimate, the number of ingestions uh, dropped by about a thousand. And once the standard was invalidated, they jumped again. So uh, this has the effect now of sending thousands of consumers, mainly children, 
to emergency departments because the standard was invalidated. I'm delighted to see that staff has worked to address the issues that the Tenth Circuit raised, and it's my profound hope that this time we will have uh, a good standard that will stand the test of time. So uh, just one or two quick questions. First of all, one of the things that's always struck me about magnet injuries, and when I've talked to my friends who are gastroenterologists, they've pointed out this is a terribly hidden hazard, that when you take a child, uh, especially one who's not really clear about what is bothering them to the uh, emergency department, uh, they don't necessarily find out quickly what the problem is. Can you describe in greater detail how it is that folks actually determine that a child uh, has swallowed magnets? Uh, and I think, Stephen, that's directed to you, but uh, I realize you're not a doctor, but uh, ba based on the uh, in-depth investigations you've read, how is it that uh, that there, these uh, injuries are manifested and uh, how likely is it uh, when you bring a child in for it to be discovered? Uh, as you'd imagine, it depends on a, a variety of circumstances. Um, the best case scenario is that the caregivers are aware of the ingestion. Um, in many cases, they aren't. Many times they indicate they don't even know where the magnets came from. And when that happens, then you have real problems because child shows up, they don't know what's wrong. The symptomatology is, um, is often delayed and misdiagnosed, such as a stomach flu or virus. Um, and as we as, as my excellent health sciences staff discusses in the um, health sciences memorandum, um, x-rays are not enough to identify a, a magnet as a magnet. They just identify that there's an object. Um, and <clears throat> that further delays proper treatment. It, it's one of the things that causes patients to be sent home prematurely. Um, Another issue is even if the parents are aware that the child had access to magnets, they may not have expected the child to swallow the magnets, and they may not be familiar with, with the hazard. Uh, well, that, that's an excellent answer that was probably directed to the wrong person. Um, I did want to make some sort of overall uh, assessment of this NPR, and as I read the NPR, uh, it looks like we're taking F963, our toy standard, and we are extending it to things not covered, such as magnet sets, jewelry, and non-children's toys. Uh, implicit in that is the assumption that F963, the toy standard, is a good standard. Uh, are you confident, based on the data that you've seen, that F963 really has stood the test of time, at least with respect to the requirements for magnets? Yes, based on the available evidence, the, mag the magnet strength requirements testing prohibition in F963 does appear to have been effective. And as far as we have seen, it is the best available option. We have it in our own law. It's, it's used in international standards and prohibitions. And, and we, we have found it to be effective thus far, although we continue our, our research. And if I understand, if I recall correctly, uh, we're asking uh, specific questions about that in the NPR, which uh, is full of uh, inquiries to the public, which I greatly appreciate. Um, one of the other points that I would note is that NICE in particular shows a large number of unidentified products. Um, and I would just say that as far as I'm concerned, uh, among the identified products, there's substantial evidence that this is a serious hazard. But uh, you do some amazing analysis, as far as I'm concerned, to reach the conclusion that a large percentage of the unidentified products fit within the draft standard. And could you briefly review wh what it is that led you to that conclusion? Yeah, sorry, one second. Just want to collect my thoughts. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I don't mean to ask cosmic questions, but this is something that 
I thought the staff analysis was uh, was really quite sophisticated. And so uh, if you could just briefly hit the highlights, uh, why you think that the uh, unidentified products typically uh, would fit within the standard. Uh, uh, we concluded that a substantial proportion of the magnet products with uncertain identification are products subject to the draft proposed rule based on our, our investigation of magnet ingestion trends relative to the vacated rule of magnet sets, as you mentioned, um, known products involved in incidents, particularly from the CPSRMS reports, um, based on the product utility and behavioral patterns, um, cases relative to the CPSE recall activity, again, international actions, and input from consumer advocacy groups, among other factors discussed in the draft NPR package, um, including the Poison Control Center and other studies. Yeah, thanks very much. I really appreciate it. I wasn't trying to ask stump, stumper questions, uh, and you did a great job in responding. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Adler. Turning next to uh, Commissioner Bianca for 10. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the um, presentation. Uh, I actually do not have any questions. Thank you. It's a high compliment to the staff. Um, Thank you. Turning to uh, Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, listen, I, I appreciate everybody's work uh, on this matter. Many of my questions today uh, relate to the legal discussions that will be held right after the briefing. Uh, but that said, given the issues surrounding uh, the, the magnet ingestions that have been an issue now uh, since at least the mid-2000s, I'm hopeful we can progress to a rule that will finally address the, the surrounding issues and, and keep American children safe. Um, with that, I, I do have a few questions that I believe are appropriate for uh, this open session. Uh, and I'll start with you, uh, Stephen. On slide 17, you discussed that magnet children's toys are now now largely comply with the standard uh, and are, are not involved in internal uh, interaction incidents. But given the ambiguity that arises out of the NICE data regarding this product type, how can we be certain? It, it seems to me that the NICE issue is an ongoing one, uh, and, and it's something that, that it, that's a result of a, 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 is a, 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 an error in the design of the reporting system or that the medical personnel aren't keeping the ingested magnets long enough for our investigators to determine uh, the specifics about uh, the, the, the type of magnets that are ingested. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I agree, There's, there is uncertainty built in. And a lot of what we have is correlation rather than causation. However, it's taking all of the bits of data that we have and combining it together that led us to this conclusion. Um, again, it's our, our continued investigation of magnet ingestion trends relative to the vacated rule of magnet sets, known products involved in incidents, product utility and behavioral patterns, um, the cases relative to the recall activity, international actions, and input from consumer advocacy groups and medical associations. So it sounds like there's some significant gaps in what we know, and and what you've done is is to I interpolate to to have a more complete picture based on a series of of assumptions based on the input that you just provided. Yes, Steve. Steve, this is uh, Dwayne Boniface. If I could help uh, help here a bit, uh, one of the items that Steve talked through uh, in the initial briefing is noting that despite uh, significant compliance focus on uh, toys. Uh, and magnetic toy products in particular over the last number of years, there have not uh, been identified a large number of these products that have, uh, 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 that failed the F963 standard. So I think that in combination with the uh, signif statistically significant changes in the overall uh, uh, hazard patterns uh, between the uh, period preceding our rule, during our rule, and after our rule was vacated, uh, leads staff to have confidence that uh, it's really these products uh, that uh, that are uh, causing the hazards no, uh, noted. Uh, the NICE system is um, 
uh, is set up to help us uh, provide that kind of uh, statistical representation. It's a tremendous tool for us in that regard. A as you note, uh, it's not necessarily going to go down to the individual product, for example, manufacturer, make and model, because it's based on hospital emergency department records, and the attending physician is more focused on providing the medical care than necessarily identifying which, you know, make, model, brand, and, and so forth of the product. Uh, but I, it's out of the collection and the synthesis of all these different data streams, uh, as well as uh, compliance in-depth investigations and so forth, uh, as delineated in the staff briefing package that uh, gives staff the confidence. That's helpful. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, listen, given that uh, staff has started, has stated that the sellers are located overseas, and in, in, including in China, and are selling uh, these products directly to consumers, does staff have a sense of, of how many of these sales are likely to continue even if a rulemaking is concluded successfully? Again, assuming that a final rule is adopted and many sellers are overseas, is there a sense uh, on what CPSC uh, would do to restrict or eliminate these sales? Unless, Steven? Sorry, can you hear me? Um, Yep. Unless Wayne has something he'd like to comment on this, um, we'll have to get back to you on on this question. Okay, that's fair. I, I, I thank you. Um, I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time, and I do have some more questions, uh, so maybe we can get through them quickly. Uh, can, can you speak a little bit uh, uh, to, to how the rule imposes the the least burdensome requirements that prevent or adequately reduce the risk of injury? Uh, could could a voluntary standard here address these concerns equally as well? Uh, to the extent that a voluntary standard would be complied with and strong enough to mitigate the hazard, yes, but we can't, I, I don't believe that we should rely on a standard such as F3458 because it's unknown if and when the revision will be published nor to what extent the scope may be limited and with which it'll be complied. I and noticed I, that, sorry, if, if, I, going, go if, ahead. I just, if I could just add a little bit, uh, cause I, I don't think Steve's taking enough credit for all the great work that he's been doing with ASTM to try to get voluntary standards in place uh, to address these hazards. Steve's been working over a number of years on this particular hazard pattern and in this product area, and has been working to try to get uh, effective standards in place uh, while there are, are, are some discussions about uh, modifying uh, the voluntary standards, we have a long history of, of, uh, 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 of inadequate voluntary standards outside of the F963. Um, certainly we'll continue to engage uh, with ASTM and others to uh, try to develop those effective standards. But at this stage, we've we've not seen any that uh, that we feel are both effective and widely complied with. That's helpful, Dwayne. Again, thank you. Um, I, I noticed, and, and, and you stated now that that children's toys and uh, uh, home and kitchen products and educational and research products are, are outside of the scope of uh, of the rule here. Can you speak a little bit about to what confidence you have uh, that that producers of of these sets may not come back and, and market them, for instance, as science and educational uh, 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 products that, that, that are, you know, explicitly excluded here. Uh, you know, what, what assurances can you give that, that we would have the ability to enforce against products that, that are essentially the same but just rebranded and market, uh, marketed something slightly differently? That is certainly a concern that we considered. And one of the reasons why we recommend soliciting from the public comments on the product scope, including intended uses, um, we would certainly um, analyze products on a case-by-case -case basis for reasonably foreseeable use, hazardous use, for sure. Um, to get more detailed than that, I'll have to get back to you after. Okay. Uh, my, my last question, uh, on slide 15, Stephen, you, you discussed uh, more evidence leading staff to conclude that a, a substantial proportion of the incidents here involve products that are subject to the draft proposed rule. C can you go into a, a little bit more detail regarding this point? 
I'm very sorry, but can you repeat that? You 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 discussed on slide 15 that that there's there was more evidence that led to your conclusion that a substantial proportion of the incidents uh, here involved products that are that are that are subject to the draft proposed rule. What 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 other evidence were you looking at that that led you to this this conclusion? Um, so so I'll, I'll jump in to, to help because I think it's a continuation of a, the discussion we were having earlier in that uh, what we were uh, uh, what we have seen uh, particularly since our rule was was vacated is again a statistically significant increase uh, in the number of incidents with uh, ingested magnet sets uh, through the NICE system. Uh, and over that same time, despite a very concerted effort by the compliance team, uh, looking at uh, toy uh, magnets uh, in particular, we've not seen a uh, anywhere near kind of that, that level of increase. Uh, so that's, that's a big reason why we had the, uh, the confidence there. I understand. Uh, th thanks. And I can, I'll, I'll reserve. I can add. I'm to sorry. That. Go ahead, Meredith. I'm sorry. Yeah, I can add to that as well. Um, we list some of, you know, the key factors that help support that conclusion in the draft NPR. Um, and like Dwayne mentioned, a lot of it is based on that trend data from when the magnet set rule was in effect and then later vacated. It's also based on developmental and behavioral factors in terms of what types of products are likely to be provided to or accessible to or appealing to children, um, as well as of the products where we could identify the products involved in the ingestion incident, the vast majority of those in the identified category are amusement and jewelry products, nearly all of them. Um, so that's another indication we use to conclude that of the unidentified products, that trend likely also holds true. Um, and then there are some additional factors that we lay out in the discussion of findings in the NPR that help uh, weigh in favor of why staff considers it reasonable to conclude that for the unidentified product ingestion, they were very likely to have been amusement and jewelry products. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, that's helpful. I'll reserve my other questions for the executive session, but I, I want to thank everybody for the presentations today in the video, which was great. Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. Uh, at this point in time, I want to thank all of us. Are there any further questions for the commissioners? We could do another round. I'm not hearing any at this point in time. I think Commissioner Feldman said he was going to save his questions for the executive session that's going to follow. Um, so I'd like to thank the staff for this informative briefing and to the commissioners for their active participation. You know, given the rise in injuries we've seen since the court vacated our prior rule, I hope we can move to schedule a decision on the proposed rule quickly. Um, as I noted at the start of this briefing, we'll now take a short break, say five minutes, and then re reconvene for a closed session. Thank you again to everybody. And with that, we are concluded. Thank you.